it's formed um, and we've talked a bit about coping mechanisms. Does anyone remember what identity means just in its simplest form? You can you can pop on your mics. Just hit the so, space bar. Oh, okay. That's a good shortcut. Identity, um, who who we are, who we think yeah. we are. Yeah, um, in the simple what we form. think our purpose is. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm just putting on my stopwatch so I don't go over time so um yeah and and what we believe about ourselves so identity in the simplest form is who we are who you are and what we believe about ourselves so what I'm going to do is just do a little bit of an overview of the past seven sessions so with the first the very first session that we've done this time around we talked about the sinful nature everybody remember that one so it's yeah so it's about the life that's in you that hates god and his commandments that do doesn't really care about much you sin and you just you don't worry about it um and in this state our identity is filled with messages and these messages can relate to things like some people can feel a level of inadequacy uh, there could be insecurities, worthlessness, and feelings of just being unacceptable. And so with that combination of sin and nature, it's on one path, right? It's on one track, and it's judgment and hell. We've also talked about the good news. And the good news is that we can exchange that old life, we can exchange that sinful life for Christ's life. All right? So that's the good news. In him, we, we are now acceptable. In him, we are now righteous. We're holy. We're pure. We're victorious over things like sin, the world, and, and Satan. So, so we, we get that exchange. And so on the cross, Jesus took our rejection and through a life of faith. So we've talked about repentance and faith. He, in that he came to save us from the mess of the lies that are inside of us. And he comes to make us a whole new creation. We are a whole new creature. So when we come to this place we have the man we have the the spirit of christ coming inside of us to help us with what we cannot change so we cannot change the first nature we need christ in us and he himself recreates our life he gives us life he gives us purity he gives us this holiness so again he came to take away all our sin and here's the word again, through an exchange, our life for his life. So for example, and especially when it comes to identity, can we all remember that particular scripture, um, Isaiah 53? It's, an, it's a scripture that Jez had read out and explained. Um, so with Isaiah 53, Jesus was despised. Jesus was the one who was rejected. Jesus was a man full of sorrows. So I'm just, I'm just reading through Isaiah 53. It is such an important scripture to um, undergird us as we're talking about identity. So Jesus experienced grief. Men hid their faces from Jesus. So can you remember a time where you were betrayed? Can you remember a time where you were, you were rejected? So Jesus had a lot of rejection and he experienced rejection, but he also was rejected so that we are accepted and we are made whole by, so identity is, our identity is made whole by our acceptance. So Jesus experienced, so again, this is an exchange here. He was re rejected and we become accepted. 
I'm going to read this wonderful, wonderful scripture that I've used. I've, I go back to this one and there's one, another one, especially as I 53 though. Uh, this one I'm talking about is Galatians 2.20. And it reads, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and he gave himself for me. So it's no longer I who live, but Christ who, Christ who now lives in me. Can you see that exchange that's happening? So if we were to consider our inner life and it's our personality, it's our traits, it's our thoughts, it's our emotions. If we were to take out our inner life and replace it with another life, we no longer become our old self. So an exchange means that the inner life makes you complete, a completely different person than what you are. So you receive a new life and you become this new person and you become, you don't become a sinner. You don't stay a person possessing sin. You are now, if you've done the repentance and the believing, you're a child of God. So I'm going to read out this second scripture, which is very important when it comes to dealing with identity. Therefore, this is 2 Corinthians 517. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away, and behold, the new things have come. So we have this wonderful, wonderful promise. The old you has been put to death, and we give way to this new life where it's this Christ's life dwelling within us. But this needs to happen through an exchange. And this is the, I'm just giving a bit of an overview of the past seven lessons. So Kel's going to give this wonderful illustration of this word exchange. So um, imagine that your whole life was like put onto your mobile phone. So on your phone, you've got your relationships, your finances, your life history, like every plan and every goal that you've ever had for your life, um, all of yourself, all your memories, all your emotions and thoughts, they're all built into this phone. But now imagine that God has his own mobile phone and all of himself was packed onto it. So on God's phone, you've got significance, you've got love, you've got purity you've got his connections you've got his destiny and all of his power that's put onto this phone now like what would you do if God held out his mobile phone and offered you his mobile phone but then in his other hand he's asking you to take to give up your mobile phone so that an exchange actually happens so there has to be an exchange of the mobile phones if you are to receive God's mobile phone. So when he gives you all of himself, then it's giving up all of yourself and all of your things to him. So there's a full exchange that happens. Oh, thank you, Kelly. So God's not a liar. He will promise to do this 100%. On our side, we repent and we believe in him. But if there's no exchange, then and as long as you're hanging on to the control of your phone or your life, there is no hope for your soul. So your soul will still be on that pathway to judgment and hell. So as we move forward with regards to translating life, and I hope you all do have books if you don't, please let someone know. But we're going to move on to the next chapter and we're going to move on assuming that there is a lot of um, salvation that's taken place. We're going to keep moving on. However, if that exchange has not happened, it is your responsibility to make sure that you do have the life of Christ in you 
so that the principles that we're going to talk about next can actually become true within your life and reality. However, these things cannot become reality if Christ is really not inside of you. So if you're not sure, we talked about last week about the assurance of salvation, being confident that when you stand before him, you know he's forgiven you, you know you've got life in you. If you're not sure, if you don't have that genuine assurance of salvation, which is so which is so beneficial because it does prevent future falls, but future falling away or it prevents um, a lot of conflict in your life and um, destruction. So if you're not sure, please um, make contact with someone, um, someone sharing. And like we prioritize this highly. We love talking about Jesus and talking people through into salvation. So if that is, if you're still not sure about that, please let us know. Um, so I'm going to move on with regards to identity and um, with I've got, I've got a couple of questions for you. So here we go. Here's the first question. What are the things within you that inhibit health and depth of your relationships? I'm asking myself these questions too, by the way. Do you truly want to truly love the people who are in your life in such a way that brings a blessing and health to them? How good is that question? Do you want to truly love the people you love in your life in such a way that brings blessing and health and health? Last question. Do you want to be redemptive in your connections? It's a very, very good question, especially for us who have the life of Christ within us and we have these questions that we struggle with, such as, why do I still fail? Have the life of Christ, I've repented, I've believed, but why has life not changed? Why do I still feel the same as the person that I once was, my old self? And in some ways we can think of our mind, will and emotions, which again is about our abilities, intellect, personality. So our inner self is our temperament. Imagine that we are a tool that can do nothing on its own. I want you to think of a hammer and I'll get Ken to read out a short illustration, but what if we were to think of ourselves, our inner self as a tool that can't do anything on its own, but obtain value from how it's used and who uses it? Thanks, Ken. Yeah. For example, a hammer is a hammer. What will distinguish the hammer is who uses it and what is accomplished by it. It could be used by a madman to kill someone or by a generous man to build a window at home. The same is true of the unique self. The unique self cannot be changed, but its source and purpose can be exchanged. Thank you. So again, our unique self or our inner self, our mind, our will, emotions, it, it cannot be changed. The original state, the sinful state, it cannot be changed by our own will, by our own efforts. So we're going to just talk about who was in control of our will. So if, for example, I want to bring about this concept that there are three selves I'm going to talk about the first self. The first self is the one that's under the control of sin, right? We've talked about this in week one. The self-life belongs to you. It's the old nature where your will is in control. This is a state where the person's not saved and not wanting anything to do with God. And so this person um, when it comes to their thoughts towards God, their attitudes towards God, they just, they really just don't care. Um, and they live their life in deception, in envy, and, and they follow their own desires. So that's, right, number one. And this, this state, number one, is their direction is judgment and hell. The second self, the second self of the three is 
the self life, the inner life that's redeemed, right? There's, they're saved, but they are under the control of the past identity. They're under the control of baggage and the residual of the dead person. So it's the old person, not under the control of sin, but this person is driven by passion of, of their own desires. And they this person continues to experience hell on earth. Okay, so they got, they're assured of going to heaven, but they're experiencing hell on earth. So if you can think of examples of maybe in your own life, or maybe you've seen others who have been in constant turmoil, there's emotional instability, there's always ups and downs to what we, what we could call an unbelieving believer. This person generally cannot see it. It's like the person or, you know, in many stages I've been here, where you're alive, but you're starving. You're carrying baggage and it's in you. You're the one, it's by choice, you're holding onto it. Sometimes you're generally not aware of this state. And then the third state, this is very important. The third state is being under the control of Christ. So the first one's being in control of your own life. The second state is being in your old self your um your past baggage is in control and this third state is when christ is in control he's within and he's in the driver's seat and the person begins to enter into the fullness of his being so all of the god-given talents and abilities and the intellect and the personality they properly begin to function as, as Christ intended that person to function. And the person begins to walk with God. The person begins to walk with this honor of God. And it's like whatever that person does, God blesses it. So what I want to do is state a problem here, that if we have the life of Christ within us and we close the door, to, our eyes go off of Jesus, what can happen is that we fail to detect lies and we can fail to detect emotions. So, for example, for me, a bit of a high level feeler in certain cases, it's like my emotional state or emotions really cement the reality of our lies. So, Ken, I'll get you to read out that quote. Thank you. Right. So if we have not learned to judge the source of our thoughts, it will go without saying that we are not judging our emotions, which are much more deceiving and useful to the enemy. One problem is that emotions feel the same, whether their source is truth or falsehood. So, so thanks, Kent. So emotions that are based on a lie are lying emotions so for example um again high level feeler in relationships if let's say i'm in state three but there is a pressure there's like a strained relationship that can move me into state two right so state two being um i can move into the state where i move in my old ways of thinking i have my eyes off of god my eyes come back onto myself or other people. So for me, that would probably be one of the things that could trigger me, right? Or it could be for other people, it's stress, financial pressure, um, illness of a parent, rebellion of a mate. So all what can happen in these moments is that all the old feelings and responses get stirred up again right can you kind of see how i'm circling back to that particular question why do i feel the same as before but i know i've repented and i believe so what i'm doing here and what we're going to do for with um Brig and kent in the next part is we're going to present a problem right so for example in times of loneliness and failure 
the list continues where we can close the door of our hearts. Imagine Jesus knocking at the door of our hearts and we close the door to this life and we live in a way that was before what we, when we were saved. So this is one of the big problems. Behavior, our go-tos, our coping mechanisms are a good sign that we've shifted from walking with God with our eyes on him to we, when we close the door, we can we start to notice we turn our attention and we start to fill the void within with other things that's a good sign that we've shifted into our back into our old baggage so we have another illustration um, that can help explain this thanks kent right so the heart is being discovered as far more than just a pump. Research in the field of neurocardiology, which studies how the heart and the brain collaborate, suggested that the heart actually possesses various brain-like attributes. And these attributes in the heart are forming its own intrinsic nervous system, such as a network of neurons, neurotransmitters, proteins, and support cells similar to those that exist in the brain. This means the heart and the brain can have two-way communication, but the heart can even control the brain, the hormonal system and other pathways acting independently of the brain in its own logic. Neurocardiologists also discovered that there can be residual memory of a dead person stored in this little brain the heart. Interestingly, heart transplant patients often experience false memories, emotions, identity issues after surgery. They are counseled to reject them as belonging to the dead donor and to realize that they are not that person for whom these fake thoughts and feelings are intended. So let me read um, one story of a lady who called Claire Sylvia. Claire Sylvia, a heart transplant recipient who received the organ from an 18 years old male that died in a motorcycle accident, reported having a craving for beer and chicken nuggets after the surgery. The heart transplant recipient also began to have a reoccurring dreams about a man named Tim L. Upon searching the obituaries, Sylvia found out her donor's name was Tim and that he loved all of the food that she craved, according to her book, A Change of Heart. And so we can we can see here when you when you come to truly believing in God. You like you do get a new heart. God gives you a new heart, and but with that new heart, you still retain the memories of the old person, the person that you went you once were. Those memories don't actually leave you. And um, like we may remember, did I'm not sure if we told the story, but there's a story of a of a fish. Obviously, a fish is in a pond or a lake, um, and when you when God gives you a new heart, you, you sort of give the illustration of that fish jumping out of the sea, but then realizing, wait, I can't live in this environment because this is not my normal. This is not my proper place. That's what happens when you get a new heart and you go back to your old way, like the old sinful way. When you have a new heart, you feel completely out of place because that's your, your new heart is not in sync with the old way of living. But with your mind, it's a different case in the sense that your mind remains the same. It's of the same person. So when you get triggered to start to think according to what your identity message may be like or the lies that you may start to think, when your mind gets triggered to think that way, you are essentially still that fish, but that fish actually still remains in the water because that's your. it still stays as your normal way of thinking. It doesn't shift to make you realize oh wait i'm actually i shouldn't be thinking this way and that only happens when someone actually points it out to you or someone actually makes mention of it. hey this is not healthy for you to think this way 
So understanding that the mind in itself doesn't get transformed with your heart. So to be able to then equip ourselves to effectively deal with these things, like when it comes to identity, is very critical or else we're just going to keep operating out of a lie and having the same old emotions controlling and directing our lives, even though God has actually given us his gift. God has actually given us his life, but yet we're still living, as Callie was saying, we're still living that hell on earth because we haven't actually learned how to effectively take a hold of that truth and start to walk in it. And so therefore to effectively deal with those things is very critical. And that's what we're going to learn how to do that. So following along from that, I'll be reading a scripture from Ezekiel 36. 27. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurity, from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. When Jesus truly saves someone, just as Brig was saying, um, he takes away the heart of stone and puts within us a heart of flesh. And um, Brig and Kelly mentioned that, but we don't receive a new mind. So we get a new heart, but we don't receive the new mind. We don't receive the new mind. And so they were talking about the problem of what these lies can do to us. And so I want to talk a bit more about the cure and um, what it really means to renew your mind and to actually agree and believe with something higher than those lies. Romans 12, 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by, re by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. I'll be also reading from the Passion Translation. Stop imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you, but be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit through a total reformation of how you think. This will empower you to discern God's will as you live a beautiful life, satisfying and perfect in his eyes. So as we look at the scripture, um, the first thing that it's saying is don't live the life that the worldly you lived and not think the way that the worldly you thought. And so what does it mean to renew your mind? And so that's what I'm going to talk about now. And it means to come into an agreement with what God says and what he says about you, to come into an agreement of his love for you and actually believe those things. And it's, and it's these things that actually define us. So it's not, it's not those lies and emotions. We can't like, they're so powerful if we don't let those things, um, if we don't let those things go. And I've got like a short little testimony for myself, but like, I guess just realizing as well, um, coming into an agreement is actually the true transformation, just as the others have been saying, but it's actually um, believing the word of God, realizing that he is the one that defines you when you receive new life. It's also the truth that is in you. It's also believing that. He is the truth. And um, for myself, like I remember coming to the Lord and just remember um, there was still a lot of lies I was believing about myself. I was, as a rejected person, I was believing that I was still rejected. I was still believing that I was living in shame. And <clears throat> it was my choice to actually deliberately align myself with the scriptures or align myself with what God said and actually let him define me and I realized like I don't actually have if he lives in me I don't actually have that right to define myself and so it's kind of like it's a constant journey of I get to choose whether these lies remain legitimate or 
whether I'm going to believe what God actually says. Ephesians 4, 20 to 24. That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which has been corrupted by its deceitful desires to be made new in the attitude of your mind and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So when we talk about aligning ourselves with the truth and the word of God, we're talking about, just as Paul said in the scripture, he says, the truth that is in Jesus. And so it's actually aligning yourself with what Jesus says, but like we're talking about before, what he actually did so that we could be secure in his love. And so um, when he talks about putting off the old self, he's actually talking about the attitudes of our mind, the attitudes of our thoughts, and um, those thoughts of I'm a rejected person, or those thoughts of I'm an insignificant person, or whatever it may be. But I guess the thing that Paul's trying to stress in this, the urgency is these things will rob you. They'll cause separation from God. And they're the things that actually torment us as well. And so he's saying urgently put these thoughts aside because they no longer belong to you, but they actually belong to the old man. And so he then says, put on the new self. And this is what we're talking about. He's saying, agree with the truth that is in Jesus. Agree with his words and align yourself with that because this is true. Like It's almost like this is your true salvation from your lies and the emotions attached to it. And, and then he goes on and he says, continually, well, he didn't say this actually, but it's exercise, continually exercise these these thoughts and these beliefs because the thing is oh continue to exercise your mind i should say and um this is how we become grounded in the love of god by actually believing these truths and continually believing them like i know for myself i'm continually aligning having to align myself and continually exercising those things and that's what does bring true transformation and so we have the choice of whether we choose to believe those lies continually or we actually do align ourselves with God, what God has made available to us. Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things so good so i just want to i'll finish on this thought and this thought is he's saying what is good what is true what is pure and we can align that with the truth that is in jesus we can align that that he is peace what he says about us is much higher than those lies he is good and he is the truth and so there's that choice of, okay, Jesus has done this work in my life, but now it's actually, what does he say about me? And letting him define you in that, letting him ground you in his love and also um, letting that truth really, it's that truth that really sets you free. And so after the break, we're going to have a quick break now. After the break, we're going to talk a bit more about the love of God and what it means to be grounded in that. And so it's a continual choice to actually align yourself with what God says. And it's that that actually destroys those lies and emotions. So five minute, uh, we're going to take a quick five minute break. <laughs> so go and grab a cuppa. If you need to go to the toilet or go and grab a cuppa, then uh, do that. And we'll see you in five. If you have questions, or if you have any questions and you want to stay online, then feel free to ask questions. Um, yeah, and that'd, that'd be very good if you want to do that. Mm -hmm. Nope. Oh.
Bora!